Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Thursday, June 2nd. I can't believe it's June already. We are here live. We're going to open the phone lines right now. It is a free-for-all today. I'll stay here as long as you have questions. Anything goes. If you have a question, a comment, a topic, anything at all you want to talk about, pick up the phone and dial right now. I promise you'll get through. 855-950-3835 is the number. Jump in and join us. We'll get to those calls here in just a little bit. Coming up later today, there will also be an episode of Rolling Toe with Mike and Kevin Beckett. So, Stay tuned for that. You know, with everything going on in the world right now, and there's a lot, big stuff, mass shootings, uh, Supreme Court cases, the economy, the war in Ukraine, the southern border, there's just, there's so much to be distracted by. And I think the lesson right now with everything we're going through is to not get distracted, but to get focused and to get focused on the basics. The same thing we're doing with the show. We've been talking about going back to the basics. We're doing it on um, almost every one of our shows. Pittsburgh Power is going back and creating videos where Lauren and I have done it on the health side. I'm going to put together some shows on uh, money and the financial side. But they're all about going back to the basics and just doing the basic stuff correctly and doing it over and over. That's the best way to get through a time like this. You know, we all want that big secret that's going to make everything easier. And you know what? It just doesn't exist. There is no big secret that if you just learn this one thing, then everything else works. But we always want it. We always chase it as human beings. There's this trend, you know, I I scroll hundreds of headlines every morning in business and money and finance in the stock market and health. And this trend, and it's been going on for a couple of years, but it's almost all I see anymore are these clickbait headlines, these headlines designed just to get you to click. That's all anybody cares about anymore is click on this article because it makes our numbers look better. And instead of focusing on just making numbers look better, you should have clear goals that actually work. But these headlines are always this, you know, Elon Musk answered this question with five simple words, and this changes everything. Or Bill Gates just answered this with seven questions on how to be the best leader, seven words on how to be the best leader ever. There, this trend is about these simple things that are just, they make it sound like this is the trick to everything. Those things don't exist. They just don't. What works is to just go back to the basics. Yet we always want to chase the latest and the newest. In money, it was just a month or two ago, there were an awful lot of people that were posting how much money they had made in cryptocurrencies. And every time I get a question about cryptocurrencies, I say, hell no, run the other way. This is not something you should be investing in. But we always want to think, oh, we're going to be early into this one. So what? Being early into things doesn't mean that much. Crypto is down. There are a couple cryptocurrencies that are down over 70% right now. Cryptos are getting hammered. They may come back. They may rally for two or three weeks. Who knows? It's part of the problem with cryptocurrencies is we don't have any history to know what these things are going to do. We don't know what cryptocurrency will do during a recession. We don't know what cryptocurrencies will do if interest rates go up. We know what stocks will do if interest rates go up. We know what bonds will do. We know what CDs will do. We know what credit cards will do. 
We have history on those things. And even when we have history, it doesn't mean we can always figure them out, make the right decisions. But on something like crypto, on top of all the other risks, we don't know how they respond in certain times because nobody has ever seen it. Cryptocurrencies didn't really exist the last time we had a recession. That's just one area where we're always, you know, so many people with money are looking for that next big secret. You know, how how am I going to change the way I do something? And here's the thing, if there was this big secret, if somebody discovered some secret about anything, whether it was about money or business or health, it wouldn't be a secret for long. If it really worked, everybody would start doing it. But you know, that doesn't happen very often. The one area where I could say in the last 10 years it happened in a big way is in health. For the last 50 years, we kept doing basically the same things over and over and over health-wise. We were not getting any healthier. Then somebody did come up with a new way, but you know what? That new way was just to go back to the basics. It was basically eating paleo, hunter-gatherer. That's about as basic as it gets. That was a major change. We learned how to do something differently and better. But it really was just going back to the basics. It wasn't anything crazy. Doesn't happen often, but it, it does happen But in money, don't go chasing the latest, greatest, get-rich-quick scheme. Same thing in health. Don't go chasing the latest, greatest diet pill. There's a couple of new diet pills out on the market now. It's not going to work. What does work is just going back to the basics. The other thing I would say is, It's time to get really, really honest with yourself about where you are in your business and money and health. You know, those are three big areas. I'd pick one of them and start working on them. But the the trick is to get really, really honest about where you are right now. And if you've made some financial mistakes, maybe you bought a new car you shouldn't have bought, or maybe you bought too much house, it's really difficult to admit that we screwed up really big and fix it, but there is still some time to fix some things. They're not going to last long. The real estate market's starting to turn. The equipment and auto market is starting to turn, but they're still, you can still make some money out there by selling things. So if you think you may have put yourself in a bad position and you're not sure what to do right now, or maybe you've put yourself in a good position, but you're still not sure what to do right now, call me. We can talk about it today. Speaking of calls, the phones are starting to get busy. If you want to jump in, I would dial right now, 855-950-3835. I just looked, Matt sent me a text. Um, Fuel is going up 20 cents again tomorrow, according to Nastic. Another big, big jump in fuel. Looked like they might have started to turn the corner and come down. Not anymore. And this is part of what we see when we get to the top of a market. We start to see a lot of volatility, a lot of up and down. Uh, what is the market doing today? The Dow is, uh, yeah, it's down a little bit, trying to hold even. But we're, we're seeing a lot of that volatility in a lot of different markets. Let's, uh, let's go to Florida, speaking of Matt. Matt, welcome. How about now? Now I can hear you. I have no idea what there changed. There we go. <laughs> I have no idea what changed, though. I didn't do anything different. Yeah, I heard, you know, the beat several times. It put me back on hold, and huh. um, I don't know either. <laughs> that was weird. All right. Um, well, what's on All your right. mind today? All right. Well, I uh, had some line of police cars here just past me. Um, this past weekend, they say, is the beginning of the summer driving season. And uh, you would think, 
fuel must be cheap because <laughs> everybody's out driving. <laughs> I've spent more time in traffic this week than I have in a long, long time. Yeah, that seems just seems crazy with everything that's going on with inflation. You would think I, it's such a weird time. You know, I think people are so sick of the last couple of years. They want to get out. They want to do stuff. And I still think people have money. That's why this uh, we're just in a really weird time financially. I just don't think it can last much longer, though. I, I honestly, it's it's shocking that people are out driving and they're out driving fast. Oh yeah, yeah. And speed yeah, is another thing. Um, so the whole secret and just on the financial side of it, is, this is nothing I've ever put together. This all just comes from listening to Dave Ramsey. So his biggest thing, you know, people talk about timing the market. We had a long run-up for many years, and now it's in a downfall, and people think they missed it. Well, you never really miss it, because now it's going down, so now it's a great time to invest. Yeah, exactly. But he says it's not timing the market, because you can't. There's Nobody's ever been able to time the market. The secret is time in the market. <laughs> Consistently <laughs> investing over your working career, always works. Kind of what my open was about. It's just putting money, it, whatever you decide to invest into, which is the first step. It, you know, we, we should all be investing for the future so that you don't have to work till you fall into your grave one day. You have to decide what you're going to invest into but then it's really, like I said, it's just about the basics. Once you decide, you just keep putting money in and you do it month after month, year after year, and it'll go up and it'll go down. And uh, for the most part, if you follow some basic rules, it will grow. It will beat the rate of inflation. You'll actually gain money over time. But we, we run off chasing all these exciting new things and we just don't stop to just do the basics. That I, I like that. It's not, you can't time the market, but you want time in the market. Whatever market you choose to invest in, whether for you it's gold or, you know, collectibles or classic cars or real estate or whatever. Uh, it's really all about just doing the basics over and over and over. And the longer you can do that, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, and that day's most recent book is Baby Step Millionaires. And I'm not going to remember the percentages, but something, well, let's start this way. So I think it was around 90% of millionaires. And these are regular people, regular jobs. All their money is in their paid for house and in their corporate. 401k. That's how they become millionaires over time. Yeah. 15% of your income should be invested and work aggressively to pay down your mortgage so you have equity. Yep. And I think it was 70, somewhere in the 70 some percent of millionaires have never made over $100,000 in a year. I could believe that. These are average people. Average jobs. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I, I can believe that. It's, it's, it's time and the basics, and that's all it is. And now's a really good time to remember that. You know, and that's, I mean, that's my life story is, you know, I've, I'm at, uh, coming up on 20 years of investing and, and, and following all that, and it's, my net worth grows. Well, not every day recently, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it grows every year. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. Watching net worth right now, especially if you have any money in the market is, uh, 
It's not as much fun when you have those big down days, but it's, it's just part of what happens. Honestly, we have not seen anything all that horrible yet. No, yeah. I called a week or two ago, and the S&P 500 is still only at like 17.9% down year to date since the first of the year. Right. Still hasn't even broke that 18% mark, but it's, you know, up a percent, down a percent. It's, it's, it's volatile, but it's really not a huge loss yet. No. We're, we could see much, much worse. I, and I'm pretty sure we're going to. I really am. I, no. I just, you know, more and more predictions are starting to lean that way that we're going to have a recession. The market's going to tank. And we have lots of markets that could be on a bubble right now, clearly real estate and the stock market. You know, really, when we go back and look, it's usually one or the other. You know, stocks got hit hard in 08, but 08 was more about real estate than anything else. All the foreclosures, all the goofy mortgages, that's what really hurt the market. It was really led by real estate. The crash before that, early 2000s, that was definitely led by the stock market. Real estate took a hit along with it. This time, though, both stocks and real estate are on a bubble. Yeah, and I've had a thought the last couple of weeks when you've talked to John about this and, you know, his clients that are ultra wealthy, they haven't changed anything. You know, they're still investing in the race car stuff and all that. And that makes sense because most wealthy people are invested in things. And like I say, their investments are they're down a little bit, but they're still way up. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, just two years ago, way up. So it isn't really affecting them yet. Correct. That's a good there, point. There are there's a large group of people that still have a lot of money to throw around. Yeah, you know what? And for the most part, these kinds of recessions don't really change their life all that much, you know, unless it's so bad that they lost their business or something along those lines. But for the most part, those people won't change their lifestyle much during times like this. They may cut back some, they may not go out and buy two new race cars this year, but it's the people at the middle and the bottom that are going to get hurt the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the people living paycheck to paycheck and worried, you know, if they're working like truck drivers, you know, 70 hours a week and they need that. Yeah. And all of a sudden they get cut back. That's that's where things start breaking. But there's another conundrum in our economy is I don't see that happening because everybody's short on stuff. Not, not happening soon, I should say probably will happen at some point, but shortages of things, shortages of employees. So I don't see cutting hours in, in the labor market for quite some time yet. No, you really can't. I mean, every business right now is really struggling with trying to get more stuff. You know, it, 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 things are still selling. I mean, it, it's there are people with money still. We just can't get enough stuff and we can't get enough people. And it's it's starting to feel like it's stalling out at the top. I mean, it, it can't keep going the way it is. And I, I, I'm shocked that fuel prices are going up 20 cents again tomorrow. Yeah. And I've, it's been a penny or close to that the last two days. So if today's the big jump or tonight is, and we'll see what, what yeah. tomorrow brings. But uh, yeah, it's, I, that's the one that's, going to break something is because that's our consumer spending you know they if they do it without energy cost consumer spending isn't really or uh is it spending or something i can't remember which report they how they word it but really isn't that bad inflation wise i mean it's not good but it's right right when you take out energy costs it's it's 
that that's the majority of it is energy. Yeah, and second is probably food. The thing is, those are the consumables that people have to buy over and over and over and over, and there's just no getting away from it. And the the fact that both of those two are climbing so fast is what's really hurting everybody. Yeah. And I did see a report that came back down now for the month of May. Uh, the six and a half percent down from eight. So it's at least it's slowing down or, but that's, that could be bad news too at the same time. So right. Who knows? Right. Yeah. It, it's going to be a, a very strange time because like I keep saying, um, we've just never been in this place before. You know, there are pretty clear patterns we've been watching for decades in the economy. You can go back and see them. This doesn't meet any of those patterns. And that's why it's, it's volatile and why we're having a hard time figuring out what's, what's happening, really. Let's, um, let's go to Pennsylvania this time. Wade, welcome to the program. Uh-oh. Oop, looks like we just lost that call. That one just dropped. Let's go to Indiana and try this one. Eric, welcome to the program. Well, I hope everything's going well, and I hope you can hear me okay. I'm uh, making my first trip uh, to go get parts from Minneapolis to Louisville. (laughs) Got it. Um, I got a uh, question about taxes and being able to pay my child who is 11 years old. I want to start uh, teaching them a little more responsibility. Do I need to be an escort to do that? No. Um, This is a good question and a good topic, and we haven't talked about it in a while, so now would be a good time to talk about it. Um, When you own a business, there is an advantage to paying your own children to work in your business. And the IRS has set up very clear rules about this. This isn't like some weird loophole or anything, you know, all that unusual. The IRS just makes it much easier for us to hire our own children, stepchildren, grandchildren, I believe foster children, count, um, So it's a very specific rule about children and grandchildren, basically. We can throw in stepchildren and things like that, but you can't do it with your cousin or your uncle. or It's very specific about children. And the difference is that you don't have to treat them like an employee, meaning you don't have to withhold taxes. You, You can but you can set this up so that you're paying them an amount that they stay under the limit for taxes anyway. So if it's done right, they don't even have to file a tax return. Now, if they have other investments or other income, you may have to, but you can set this up fairly simple. We don't have to pay their half of Social Security and Medicare. That's different from every other employee. So there are specific rules about this, and it makes it easier And we can create a pretty big advantage because we can transfer money to them that they won't have to pay tax on because they'll stay under the limits. And it's now out of our business, so we don't have to pay tax on it or Social Security or Medicare. So there could be some pretty significant savings here. Again, there's some specific rules. I'm not going to go over them because they're just confusing anyway. If you're going to do this, you get with your tax preparer, set this up ahead of time, make sure they know what you're doing and how to do it. And then, you know, there are limits we can go look up. How much can we pay them before they would have to pay a, a, you know, file a tax return. So work with your tax preparer, get it all set up. Then the other kind of big general rule to remember about this is, the work needs to be age specific. A lot of times people will ask me, well, what age can I start paying my kids at? There's no clear rule. The IRS didn't say you can start paying them at age eight. They just say your children and that 
the work needs to be age specific and reasonable. Um, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Is it reasonable to think that I paid my eight-year-old to rebuild my engine? Probably not. But is it reasonable to think that I paid my eight-year-old to help me rebuild the engine? To get tools and, you know, to clean things up? Or Yeah, I think that could be reasonable. So there's no clear rules on that. But in one of the other things I tell people to do that, um, makes this work really well is you have your child keep a log of all the work that they do. That's part of their job, keeping the log. So now I can also pay them for the time that they have to be keeping their log. Um, but, you know, things like, um, you know, because we had a, an accounting practice, because I had an accounting practice when um, my kids were growing up, they did paperwork. They filed things and sorted and um, they got paid for that. Again, it was reasonable for their age, the work we were having them do. Yeah, so I take my truck over to my uh, ex's house and drop it off, and he does oil changes. Uh, I have to break the, uh, um, the, the drain. I got to break the drain plug loose. But he'll pull the plug and, and pull yeah. filters, and he put air filter in. He knows how to do a fuel filter and fill it up. Um, he, he greases my truck from front to back. He's only missed two grease certs since I showed him. Yeah. So, I mean, he does a really good job, but I want to get him into the accounting side of it or bookkeeping. Excellent. Now, I, I think it's fantastic. There are so many advantages to this. You know, we talk about the so tax good. advantage. But I also like the advantage of everything this teaches the children and the fact that it usually means parents and children are spending more time together. If your children are helping you in the business, that's just good time spent with your children. There are tax advantages. There are, they're going to learn about business and money and accounting and goal setting and, and all these other things you can teach them during this process. So I, I'm a big fan of this. I'll, I'll go one step further. I'm not going to go deep into the numbers because I don't have them in front of me. But I, I did the math on this. And the numbers back then, and this is what I was paying my son, I was making like $65 a month. A month. I mean, it was, you know, a couple hours a week of filing paperwork. And you think, oh, $65 a month. What's the big deal there? But I did the math. He was, oh, I don't know, eight or nine, somewhere in that area, maybe a little younger when we started doing this. And I did the math and I told him, at some point when you get turn 18, now all that $65 a month when their children all goes into a Roth IRA because they will not pay tax on any of the earnings this money makes over the next 50 years. So as long as that child has income, they qualify for a Roth IRA. So you open up a Roth, all the money goes in. In this case, the, the numbers I was using, it was $65 a month for, let's call it a 10-year-old. When they turn 18, if all they do for the rest of their life as far as saving money goes, if all they do is keep putting aside $65 a month, once you became an adult and had a full-time job, would, would it be hard in today's world to save $65 a month if you work full-time? Oh, Lord, no. We, we, we paid off debt uh, last year. At, at a rate of about $2,600 a month on nice. top of our regular bills. So nice. Yeah, it's not, not difficult to do. 65 bucks, I can come up with it in a parking lot. So, yeah. So, so here's the thing. They started, you know, at age 10. This is how powerful time is. $65 a month. If that's all they keep doing for the rest of their life, they never save another penny other than the $65 a month. The math works out to somewhere between six and seven million dollars they would retire with. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And you said that's a 10, you're, you're basing that on 10%? 
Yeah, I usually do. You know, the S&P has delivered at least 10% over any 10-year period for its entire history. So I use 10% as the, the rate of growth. And let's say that we were so far off that it was only half of that. Well, darn, you're only going to be able to retire with three and a half or four million instead. Right. <laughs> I'm Outstanding. $65 That's good stuff. I do, a month. I do have a- I do have a statement about the people at the bottom that uh, uh, you're saying probably going to get hit pretty hard. The people at the very bottom barely are going to feel this. It's the uh, the the lower middle class that's going to hurt the most. I you're think. right. You're right. Uh, the one, the one, the ones at the very bottom, they they barely feel anything when things happen. Uh, it's the lower middle class that uh, you know they they've got a little bit of something. It's not much. Uh, they probably have uh, a negative net worth, and when their little bit goes away, their net worth just goes into the toilet. Oh, uh, I think the middle class, the lower middle class especially, is just going to get hammered in this. Yeah, you know, one of the problems with giving people money is not only do they spend the money you give them, they usually commit to spending even more money than what they have. So... You give somebody some extra money from the government like they've been doing, handing it out like it's candy. And now all of a sudden, instead of buying a two or three year old used car, they go buy a new car instead. The problem with that is when the money stops flowing like it's about to do, they really can't afford that new car. But they've already bought it. It's well, it's a house of cards at that point. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Well, that's all I have for you. I just uh, that 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 was the biggest question that I had, and I think I'm going to take you take you up on that uh, Roth IRA deal. So yeah, it's a, yeah, we're going to have to do some really good digging into that. Excellent. He's a, he's a, good good stuff. Hey, thanks for bringing that one up. Like I said, we haven't talked about that one for quite a while. That's a good one, though. Let's go to Texas. Paul, welcome hey. to the program. Howdy. What's on your um, mind today? I thought. Disc brakes. I finally had to change some disc pads. How many miles? On my one million and seventy nine thousand and thirteen. No way. And I had to put new. I had to put new disc pads just on the steer axle. But the reason I had to do it is, I rotated my steer tires a few weeks ago, and I noticed that the shoes on the right hand side, or the pads on the right hand side. They'd gone down a lot more than the left-hand side from when I put the tires on there. So it's like, I might have a problem. I better get that looked at. Well, when he pulled the pads out, the piston popped out of the caliper. So one pad had actually been rubbing on the the rotor probably for a few thousand miles. And that's what, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't enough where it was heating it up or anything silly like that, and it, I didn't feel any difference in the in the in the braking performance or anything. Still stopped good, but right. as soon as he pulled the pad out, the piston shot out. So, but it was fourteen hundred and twenty for a caliper with the exchange core. But you divide that by a million and seventy nine, <laughs> I think it's still coming out ahead. So. I, I, I can't believe. <laughs> Can't believe that you got over a million miles out of a set of brake shoes or pads. That's incredible. Yeah, hey, and we, the the other side, there was still uh, probably four millimeters of usable pad on it. So yeah, nice. But I just put uh, did did both sides. So even the mechanic, he said, well, he said. The best I've seen up until you pulled in the door, he said, I had one guy that got about between 600 and 650. And it, he he didn't believe me at first, but he's like, if you're telling me, I suppose I should believe you. So, yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, but I was, on Monday, I, I decided I'd get the pressure washer out and, cleaning between the frame rails and the rear ends and, and everything. And uh, while I was doing that, 
and I'm looking at stuff, and it's like, I've never even replaced a U-joint on this tractor unit yet. I've all all original U-joints, never done anything to the driveline. Wow. Bruce will probably be lining me up. You need the driveline looked at. <laughs> so maybe I'll do it on a, a, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But uh, like Joel said, the running slow, it saves you money on maintenance. I'm convinced of that. It, it does. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's no doubt. Yeah. You know, the other thing we, we can, and we have complained for a decade about emission problems and, you know, new trucks, this and that. And But the one thing we have to say is just like cars, trucks have gotten to the point where there are parts we almost never replace anymore that we used to replace a lot. And to hear that brake pads went a million miles is just incredible. But, you know, if, if you buy yeah. these trucks right, if you spec them right, if you drive them right, if you take care of them, they're actually pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've got 440000 on my Pittsburgh Power Rebuild. You know, it was sort of done prematurely, but it's a it was a soot packing Cummins that polished the balls. Yeah. But since it was rebuilt, I've had, I'll use the catalyst. I got probably 380,000 miles worth of catalyst use. Um, I've almost had zero emission problems. I've had a couple of knock sensors and a couple of other piddly little things, but that's been about it. So, well, and, and nothing major. Yeah, that's the thing. Now that we've really figured out if you spec them right, drive them right, use the catalyst, do some of the maintenance. We've talked about the cleanings, you know, every couple hundred thousand miles, not that big of a deal, makes these trucks pretty trouble-free. And a, a lot of these parts yep. are lasting a lot longer than anything ever used to. So um, there's there's certainly some upsides. I'm not excited that we've got another round of emissions we have to meet in a couple of years, but... Um, you know, there's there's a lot of positive. And, you know, talking about getting back to the basics and, you know, the opportunities that are coming, there's going to be an awful lot of really good trucks available at really good prices in the next year, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, normally I go to Pittsburgh Power once a year, usually in the spring or the summertime, but... I'm going up there at the end of July, and I don't know how. I'm probably going to spend quite a bit more this time, but um, I'll still be trucking on down the road and nothing to worry about. There you, there you go. Knock on wood. So, yeah, so that's all I got today. That's all I need. Thanks for the call. Let's go to North Dakota. Uh, we're opening up some phone lines. If you want to jump in, I'll stay as long as you've got questions. It's a free-for-all. Anything goes. If you have a question, a comment, a topic, anything at all you want to talk about, if you dial right now, you will get in. I promise. 855-950-3835 is the number. We just actually lost a line or two, so jump in and join us. We're going to head off to Pennsylvania. Wade, welcome. Oh, hold on one minute. I think I tried to put too many people... No, oh, you're yeah. you're on me in North Dakota. Yeah, I was on you. I almost added Wade into the conversation. Wade, you've got to wait your turn. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah. So the sudden uptick in authorities that has happened, do you think that could possibly be caused by the threat of AB5? I think it could have been. California and yeah. the possible threat of it happening in the general, uh, yeah, the I, other 47 states. I, I think that is a part of it. I think um, certainly owner-operators in California probably did that because they were kind of under the gun. So I think that's a part of it. That's a, what we saw the run-up. The other okay. part was the crazy high rates. You know, everybody wanted to get a piece yeah. of that. But I, I do think AB5 had an impact on this. Okay, my other comment is the speed limiters over in Europe. I was over there a while ago and heard that if 
a truck was passing another truck and they got more than three cars behind that them and it kind of backed up it was a ticketing fine so that's just a comment i had um your miles on your personal vehicle writing off going to the bank instead of getting parts is that right right there right, is that something you can write off or yes. is that just yeah, and it, okay. cause going to the bank, there's a business reason to do that. So that's deductible. It, we could even, I mean, okay. let's say that you're going to the grocery store for your normal weekly groceries and you happen to pick up something as simple as paper clips that you use in your business in the office. That's a deductible trip. Okay. Um, I really like the way that you're taking my idea with back to the basics. I just wanted you to not forget to do one with uh, brakes with uh, Andy from Brake Safe. We need to do that. You're right. Brakes are one of the places we really just should stick to the basics. Yep. I agree. So thank you. But that's the four things I had written down here. I just wanted to get across. So thank you very much for your time. You have a nice day. Thanks for the call. And I've got a note here. We've got to get on that with Andy. You're right. I agree. All right. Now, Wade, it's your turn. Welcome. Hey, there I am. You scared me last time. There you are. What's on your mind today? (laughs) Well, I was going to piggyback a little bit on your open about being prepared and also knowing your numbers, not necessarily on the business aspect, but knowing your numbers and your personal finance is also important. Um, just so, you know, you know, if you're making progress or you're not, things get out of control when you stop paying attention to them. Um, I called you a few times in the past, I share my story a little bit, but it was like maybe late 2015. I caught one of your rants on the radio about, you know, getting control of your personal finances and you talked about Dave Ramsey and recommended the total money makeover. So, uh, I was recently within a month before that I had gotten married and I was like, nah, you know what? I should probably try this. I'm the man of the house now. I got to make sure I'm taking care of both of us now. So, um, I have some number. Oh, I also started using mint at the same time oh, good. based on your recommendation. So, I have some numbers here that I'd like to share with you because they're, when I look at them, they're just shocking for, you know, what I consider to be, I'm a normal guy. Sure. And it's neat to see progress made. Uh, So in January of 2016, that's how far I went back. I may have signed up for Mint slightly before that, but I went back to January of 2016. The net worth tracker was 25,000 was my net worth our net worth, me and my wife. Um, and I'm just going to read through these real quick. It's going to be January of the next few years. So in 2017, it was 53,000, 2018, 100,000, 2019, 137, 2020, 203, 2021, 309 and 2022 was 429. Holy shit. Um, Seriously. Yeah. I mean, we're, (laughs) that's incredible. I love that. And it's not like, we're not doctors and lawyers. We're not making like 500,000 a year. We're, I'm a truck driver. I make roughly 110 to 120 a year. And my wife is a nurse. She's currently not working because of uh, Mr. Brandon, but yeah, she, uh, we've been doing like our best year was last year. We did 179, but I'd say average since we got married is about 130 a year. So it's not like we're, whoa, really knocking it out of the park, but just paying attention to what you're spending, not buying new cars every two years, saving, investing, you know, that's, that's the power of this. And I, I, I owe a lot of it to you, not necessarily because you did the work, but you put the, you put it in my mind and like the tools that you you share with us are so important for changing people's lives. I mean, I'm not an owner operator. I'm not, I'm a truck driver, but I'm not an owner operator, but the stuff you have on your show is, you know, obviously making a difference. Well, you know, what you just described is is very, very basic. 
I mean, you just took some control of your money, and and honestly, you can't get any more basic than Dave Ramsey. I mean, seriously, the guy has done incredible things on on almost you know two or three ideas, and and they haven't changed in you know the decades he's been doing this. It's just you know that really is the basics, but it it also shows how powerful. The basics are, and you're a great example of what Matt talked about, that the average person in today's world who becomes a millionaire doesn't do it on some crazy high income. They do it on kind of an average normal income. They just spend years focused on making good decisions around money and and over time, you see what happens. I mean, you've done incredible things in a short amount of time. Yeah, and that I've read that book too that he was speaking about, that Everyday Millionaires, that kind of talks about the, not necessarily just millionaires in general, but it talks about the millionaires that followed his program. And it's it's incredible to, to hear that number. That was the most shocking for me is the percentage of people that never made over $100,000. It's like, you know, eight, 88% of millionaires are first generation millionaires, which kind of dispels the myth that everybody inherits their money. Exactly. I mean, every, you know, that, that 70% that never made over a hundred thousand, that dispels the myth that you got to be a doctor or a lawyer or a politician or like, this is, it's possible. I mean, people, when I tell people that I'm planning to be a millionaire, like, it's not like a, Oh, I, Oh, I have a dream. I want to be a millionaire. No, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, you you don't they, have a they dream. They look at me like I'm like, oh, you have a yeah, plan. like I'm a stupid punk kid. <laughs> yeah, but you have a plan, and it's yeah, and it's like I'm, you know, it's it's shocking for me, even though I'm knowing knowing I'm going to be there. It's shocking to me seeing how quick this is going to happen. Like this is like I already know this is going to be maybe three to five years, depending on you know political climate and economics and stuff, but it could be five years from now, I'm going to be pushing over a million dollar net worth. And that's just incredible. That's I'm a, only 30 years old. That's a pretty awesome place to be. Congratulations. Yeah. So it's uh, the point of the call was a big thank you to you. And I hopefully, you know, Matt calls in enough. I, if I call in once every few months to share that's my right. story, hopefully from, from today, one or two more people will pick that book up and change their life like I did. You, you know, you just you made a good point. I think one of the most powerful things about this show is not so much what I say. I mean, that may start the process. I like going out, finding the tools and the way to do things and encouraging people. But I, I think the most powerful part about this show is a call like yours today. And when you keep calling back and Matt you know, has been doing it for years, and we've certainly seen it on the health side. I think the most powerful part of the show is the people who call in and talk about the results they get. Yeah, and the results, you know, not only do the results inspire you, but it also helps give you, you know, street cred, if you want to call it, to, you know, anything else you recommend. I'm not going to spend a lot of time questioning it. I'm not going to just blindly follow everything, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time digging into the details. If it looks good on the surface and you recommend it, I know it's, you know, it's good stuff. Yeah, you know and what? And, and that's, that's, a, that's nice to have somebody like that in your corner. That That's a good point. And I have people like that. I mean, I have people that I follow around finance, so I don't have to go do all of the work and verify everything. I have people that I've been following long enough. I trust them. Um, I have the same thing in health and I have the same thing in business. And, you know, that that's the beauty of, you know, the the connected world we live in today. We have access to information and um, it, it, it's it's really not that complicated. It's just a matter of doing the basics and doing them over and over. So congratulations. That's an awesome yeah, story. This, I love it. And this. Yeah, you were you were the one that inspired the, the book for me to pick it up. But when Dave Ramsey started into the, the total money makeover, what really got me interested in the idea about being a millionaire is, you know, he talked about why you do things about be building a legacy for your family. And you know, it's, a, it's just a, something that pops in your mind. You know, if you look at the legacy families in the country, you know, Rockefeller or Vanderbilt or like 
Henry Ford, nobody remembers who Henry Ford's dad was. Right. But you will, re- everybody will remember Henry Ford forever because he's the one that actually did something. Even though Henry Ford's dad was probably very important in his life, he, he, you know, he didn't build the legacy. Good point. You have to actually do the hard work at, you know, to, to build something. Yep, absolutely. Great stuff. Hey, I'm going to run. The calls are flooding in all of a sudden, so we're going to get to them. Let's go to Oklahoma. Ken, welcome to the program. Well, I guess I'm going to step back now. Although that last caller was just as good as everything you've had. You're doing great now. Uh, back to what Paul was saying about his driveline. He's got a million miles on his driveline. I, I would tell him to hate to say it, ignore Bruce and don't do anything unless it tells him he needs it. Cause I had a million two fifty on mine when I pulled it out, got it checked for straight and balance. It was fine, but new U joints, new carrier bearing in it. And I've had to replace three U joints since then where my original ones were doing fine. The, the back drive line between the axles never been out of this truck. Still got original U joints in it at 2 million and 38,000 miles. And they're tight, and the slip yoke's not worn out. So I ain't messing with it. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. There are some things that we should definitely do, preventative maintenance. But then there are other things that we can just keep an eye on things and inspect them. And I think the drive line is one of them. There are drive lines that should be worked on and replaced and cleaned up at a certain point. But it's not always just some random number. Uh, if you've really taken care of it and you don't have any kind of, a, you know, a, a bounce, a shake, a vibration, or you get under there and you can physically inspect all of those parts. And if they don't have a lot of excess play, I, I'm with you. Like this is one of those things that if I, I, I can tell if there's excessive wear there and if there is, we'll fix it. But if there's not, I'm not going to mess with it either. I've got other components on that, that you know, how many times do you go buy something new and the new one's worse than the one you took off? Yeah, I know. And I've, I, I've got several cases of that, and I'm in a situation, I'm not a guy with a KCB C13. I got another question for you on that, but at 249,000 miles, this thing blew its original turbos off the side of the engine. Caterpillar stood behind it, gave me new turbos, uh, you know, under warranty, all of that. They treated me right. I've got a million eight on those turbos. Bruce, I think, would just have a cow. But I just had to uh, house things off of them the other day, and they're nice and clean and tight. I've had it, you know, when I'm on the road, I had an oil cooler failure. I had it fixed at a Caterpillar dealer, and I was like, take a look at those turbos. They got a million five on them, and they're like, man, I wouldn't change them. Those things are great. Exactly. Uh, and every time I bring it up with my shop, they're like, "Yo, will the new ones you get be any better than what's on it? Leave it alone. No, so, I agree. All right. So many times. Uh, my question for you on the C13 and your coach, uh, when Pittsburgh Power was doing all the work on it, did anybody check the fuel pressure on it? No, we didn't. Uh, we've had a fuel pressure um, problem on mine for a little bit we were playing with. And again, going back to the part, the new regulator valves you get are bad. But uh, we put an external regulator on this and brought it back up to the spec it was supposed to be at. And I've picked up a half a mile a gallon since I've been back out. Huh. Maybe I should do that. Just on fuel time. pressure. So. Yeah. That's the, it's, it's easy enough to check on my truck. I feel for you in that coach, but yeah, uh, well, yeah, that's the stuff that I do every yeah. time I go home now is check the fuel pressure and check the uh, check for an intake leak is real easy to do. So yeah, well, nothing is easy on that coach. When you talked about you know <laughs> blowing two turbos off and having to replace them, I just shuddered to think of what it would be like to try to replace the two turbos on this thing. Yeah, I don't really like working around them on this one, but uh, <laughs> I can imagine in your situation. Oh. But, but anyway, I'm kind of a you know don't don't get too carried away. Sometimes you know, if you're if you're inspecting it, you don't need to replace a lot of stuff. I'm finding out. No, you're right. That's a good point. But, you know, some we complain about some parts. You know that the quality's gotten worse, but on a lot of parts, quality has gotten better. 
things last a lot longer than they used to. And it's not always, you know, just some random number to replace things. That's, that's why the more you understand about your own truck and mechanics, the more you can make those kind of decisions. Let's go to Florida this time. Nate, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin, I was calling to talk to you today about my mortgage. Okay. Yeah, I get some advice on that. Sure. Bought a house back in October and uh, bought it for 250000 put 10000 down, and I got a adjustable rate that's locked in for five years at 3.25%. I'm not quite sure what to do with it, given everything that's going on in the world. I don't know if I should try and refinance to a fix or out of it or what. uh, I was calling to see what you thought. Yeah, that's a tough call. So you are good with 3.25% until October of 2027, right? I think you've got enough time that I would wait. This is a tough call, though, I'll tell you. Um, Have you you looked at what you'd be able to lock in a a, a 30-year fixed right now, what the rates are? I haven't. I was getting ready to call uh, my loan officer here this week to see what he could do, but I didn't know what having my rate box for five years, if it, if I needed to be worried about it or not. It, it's hard to say. You know, I'm thinking back, and I wish I would have been paying more attention. The last time we dealt with anything even close to this was the early 80s. Um, I don't think that's it, before I was born. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, I'm trying to remember how long it took for those rates to come back down. The mortgage rates hey, back then mortgage rates got up to 15%. Yeah. When, yeah. When you look at what That's that huge. does to a house payment, how much interest you pay, it is just insanity. Um, yeah, boy, I, you know, when I get a question like this, I try to put myself in, in your position and say, what would I do? And honestly, I don't know because the problem is the rates jump so fast. The, the last time I looked, we were yeah. looking at rates in the fives now. Okay. So I would have a hard time giving up 3.25%. And jumping all the way up to five, knowing I still have five years left on this lock, I, I, I think I'd have to take my chances and just keep an eye on rates. I, I think five years, there's okay. so much that could still change. Um, it would be, I think it would just be too expensive for you to try to, to refinance right now. Okay. That's all I've got for today. Thank you for everything you do for us. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a tough one. I wish I had a better answer for you, but um, we're just in a really unusual position. I read something yesterday I was shocked about. Only 8% of mortgages are adjustable right now. I, I thought it would have been much higher than that. Let's, uh, let's go to South Carolina. Brian, welcome to the program. Morning, Kevin. Thanks for taking my call. What's on your mind? I want to run something past you. I mean, well, you know, you guys, I'm on the opposite end with these guys are talking about having money out. I'm 61 years old, have nothing put up. Wasn't ever taught how to handle money. And I listened, been listening to you since 05, right after I started truck driving. And, you know, so I've learned a lot, you know, from you, which is a little too late in life on some of it. But what my curiosity was, or I was looking for a second opinion, was my home. It's, I don't know, about four more years on it, about $34,000. Is it worth with the market looking like it's looking to take, do a cash out refi, either put the money up or invest the money? <sighs> Two months ago, I would have said yes. Now that the rates have jumped up, probably not. Um, 
you know, when we can borrow money at two or three percent, it, it's not a bad idea sometimes to even borrow it and invest a little. I'm not a big fan of that, and I'm certainly not a fan of borrowing at the in the five percent range. Um, I, I just think you're you're better off focusing on saving as much cash as you can right now. Um, and not taking on any more debt. Here, here's the thing. If we look at this, any time we take on debt, we end up with less money on the bottom line, unless we were able to go out and invest in a way that beat what we were paying in interest. And I just don't know how to do that right now. There's, there's no place in the market that no. you can put money that you're going to be able to beat 4 or 5%. So you're by borrowing, we'd actually be going backwards right now. Well, I've got a friend that, uh, now his wife passed away. He sold his business. He's 72 years old. So he's got just, I think, a 505, 505,000 tied up to a financial planner. And he said he's getting a guaranteed 7% through this guy here, which I, I've read, you know, don't lie, I know a good bit about this stuff. It, that just so, doesn't make any sense. With, so there are, one of the things you have to be careful of, there are some investments, there are some government bonds that may be what he's got, that right now you can go buy a certain government bond that's paying a pretty decent rate of return. The thing about that is you're very, very limited how much you can put in there. If this guy is getting a guaranteed 7% on, a, I think you said he has like a half a million dollars or something, um, I'd love yeah, to know. Yeah, between selling his business and life, yeah, life I, insurance where his wife just passed away I, and all. If you could, I would love for you to call me back and tell me what that investment is because I don't think it exists. Uh, yeah, I, I just thought it sounded a little far-fetched, but uh, yeah, I want to talk further about it. Uh, before you cut me off, I got another question about Cardio Miracle after we get through with this. But. Okay. Yeah, I like I said, uh, there, there are some government bond programs where each individual can buy a certain amount of bonds, and they are paying a pretty decent rate of return right now. And if you have cash, you should have those bonds. But they're very, very limited. I mean, if, if trust me, if those if that bond program was unlimited, all of my money would be in it, every penny. But you can't. There's a limit. Yeah. And it's a fairly low limit. I mean, it's it's not a lot of money. It's nowhere near a half a million dollars, not even a hundred thousand. It's it's nowhere near those kind of numbers. And other than that, I have no idea what he could be looking at that guarantees seven percent in today's market. Yeah, he's yeah. It, uh, that's what I like. I say I don't know what it is, but I have my cue rushed yet because I just you just don't see that around in today's market. But no, no, not with interest rates uh, where they are. Yeah, no, that's right now considered. You know, refinancing, you know, the cash out refi, pull the hundred thousand out of the house and put up. Uh, because I know more than likely the real estate's going to bottom out. That's the reason why I'm, I'm kind of back and forth about that. And I thought, okay, let me get a second opinion of somebody I trust, and I trust your your opinion and your knowledge on uh, this type of stuff. So, yeah. So there's two things here. One, I don't. I, I mean, I I don't know of anything today that would pay anywhere near seven percent guaranteed. Not on a large amount of money. That's one factor. The other factor you really want to be careful of in today's market. And I don't know the numbers on your home, but we also would want to be careful that we don't borrow enough money that we put ourselves in a position where we could end up upside down when real estate values tank. Yeah, the house is worth about somewhere around about 220 the last time I had it appraised. Okay. You'd be pretty safe then, you know, borrowing 100000 I'm just not sure that oh. it makes any sense well, my- today. Now, again, if you could call me oh, back I just thought- and say, I talked to my friend, here's the investment, I'll go check it out for you. And if it's a true, you know, guaranteed 7%, I'd be all over that. Yeah. Yeah, probably everybody would. So that's written. It didn't make sense. But anyway, you know, neither here nor there. We're just, I'll find out and we'll go from there. But right. uh, cardio miracle. Yes. Cardio, uh, when I take it, take it in the morning, if I take it before I eat, 
when I eat breakfast, I'm going to lose everything. It just all comes back up. So I've got to where I do it, you know, later on in the day, uh, after breakfast is settled or, you know, whatever I've ate and, uh, sip on, along on it, really just, you know, take it all down at one time like that. I'm just doing it once a day. Is once a day sufficient or do I need to still try to get two of those servings in a no. day on it? Uh, you know, it'd be nice I to have, get... I have, It'd be nice to well, get in too. So I've got, you know, I've got it, issues. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. not necessary. I mean, one is better than none. Um, two is better than one. But most days, I only take one. I usually don't. Yesterday, I think I actually did two. I was working out in the garden a lot, but I, I normally don't get to that second one either. So one is fine. I, I, I'm more concerned. So what you're telling me is if you eat breakfast and drink the cardio miracle, you actually throw everything up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's uh, a that, little strange. I don't, I don't get that. Is cardio miracle. You know, the it only thing that does before that? You... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it says to you know, do it 30 minutes beforehand. So if I, you know, drink it down on an empty stomach and then when I eat, it's just, Within about thirty minutes of eating, that it, you know, I'm I'm sick and everything wants to come back up, which is kind of strange. But that's really strange. doesn't bother me. Otherwise, sip it. I'll, I'll mix it with my my unsweet tea and uh, drinking it, sipping on it during the daytime, and I'm fine. How bizarre! Have you ever done a NutriQ? Been a long time ago. I'd like to see what that, that is. Such a weird thing. I wonder. I, I can't even think of what could um, potentially cause that. I guess for now, do well, what I mean, you're doing. Uh, you know, just wait and sip on it later in the day. But um, I, I'd be curious to know why that's occurring. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to run past you to see. What you, if you heard anything like that, long. Yeah, I well. mean, I'm. I started, I done the keto, uh, what was it, 19? Yeah, I think it was 2019 I did it. Uh, December of 18, my A1C was 9.9. My father just, I got tired of hearing these stories of people coming off their medication and losing all this weight. You know, so I got onto it and done that. And then uh, I, A1C went from uh, 9.9 down to 5.4 in about four months, you know, just by my eating and I'm done good for a year or two. And then I kind of get back out of it and I'm back and forth. It's kind of a yo-yo thing right now, but I just, uh, when I go home and eat, eat at home, I have issues there because my wife still fixes the same thing. She's always fixed the last 40 years of marriage. So. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a tough one. Oh, uh, so yeah. So, yeah, but anyway, with that right there, the, uh, free stent and all, you know, you know, anything to try to help, you know, to, to try to eat right and do the best I can with it. But, you know, but then when it does, when it comes back up, it's just kind of strange. But That is weird. And there's, I just can't think of a single reason why that would happen. If you get a chance, you may want to go in and mm-hmm. do a nutri and then call me back and we'll go over it. Maybe there's some clue in there somewhere. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you for your time, Kevin. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. Let's go to BC. Murray, welcome to the program. All right, Kevin. Thanks for taking my call again, as usual. What's on your mind today? A uh, couple, of, couple of quick comments, and then, uh, and then you can have them discuss that oil sample with me. Um, Paul, earlier you and he were discussing driveline length of time and stuff, running 55. It, we, we, those of us that do, we all know the advantages, but there's one thing I never hear you all talk about is how it makes you feel when you run 55. If you, you, if you get to the end of your day, you don't feel like you've been road hard and put away wet. I agree. You know, I, you, I, you go down the road at 75 mile an hour, you feel like crap at the end of the day. You, I agree. I agree. I swear when I have to run hard, like I did a lot on this last trip, um, when I have to run hard at the end of the day, it feels like my whole body is vibrating and it just won't stop. Yeah. And, and you know, like you can, like I can compare that. You just go, go ahead and run along for an hour at 75 and then slow down to 55 and see how you feel 10 minutes later. 
you just relax, all the stress kind of just comes out of you and you yeah. just sort of relax and you just listen. And you can hear the radio. Yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> you know? There, there is one other factor, though, because I've actually had people tell me the exact opposite, that when they slow down, it stresses them out so much. Sometimes in the beginning, and it has to do with your mindset. If, if when you slow down, you immediately start stressing about how long it's going to take you to get somewhere, and you, it, that will stress people out. If the mindset is, look, I'm going to get there. I'm just going to do it a little slower, a little more relaxed. You're right. It is a game changer. But some people actually get stressed when they first try to slow down. That, that's true. If you, feel like, if you feel like you're losing time, you feel like you're falling behind. But if you start learning about fuel mileage and how to get fuel mileage <laughs> yes. and how to treat your truck, you're, you'll be so entertained looking after your truck and watching your gauges and driving and watching the road. You won't have time to worry about how and, slow you're going. <laughs> and, and, and then what you find is you still get everywhere you need to get on time. Yeah, yeah. You maybe just, you know, spend two hours less at the truck stop that night. Yeah. You know, big deal. Yeah. Wait exactly. and unload the next morning. Yeah. So there was that. Second one is Dave Ramsey. Norma and I are a year and a half into a four year debt reduction plan because, like Dave says, debt is dumb. It's doggone if it isn't. Uh, so, yeah, we're uh, that. You know what? What he teaches is the simplest thing to learn. We haven't done his whole thing with, with like buying his course and all that we know how to budget our money and all that sort of thing. We just got ourselves into a pile of debt in the last 10 years. And so we're working on our, our four year plan to get rid of it. Excellent. So uh, it, it, yeah, total money makeover. I'd recommend it to anybody Got our kids. One of our kids is, has, has got his crap together and he started to do it. And he's 25 this year Excellent. in, in August next month. And, Excellent. And at 25, he's going to be debt free in, in a couple of months. You're like, Man, I wish I could go back and do that over again. Oh, I know. I know. You know, it, anyway, it, it's anyway, exciting okay. to watch our kids learn the right things. And, you know, it's exciting to, yeah. to help our kids learn more about, you know, the basics of money and the basics of health. And yeah. uh, it's shocking how little we actually teach people about the things that are really important in life. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I was 13... Uh, there was a lady in our church took me under her wing and tried to teach me. She was working for, uh, I guess it was A.L. Williams then. Now it's Primerica. And and she told me that, you know, you've got to invest, you got to invest. And she kind of lit a fire in me. And I read a bunch of books and I learned a bunch of stuff. But not to the point that it ever, but then she also didn't tell me what to do or how to do it. She just, just that this is what you do need to do. But that's all the information she gave me. Well, that doesn't do you any good. Right. Right. So I didn't actually learn what to do. Uh, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I had a rudimentary understanding about investments and how to, how to go about that. But how does a normal guy take his money and put it in an investment? They don't, most people don't know that. And you don't, like you said, we don't teach our kids that. No. So anyway. All right. Um, good stuff. Well, oil, oil sample. You have that in front of you. Yeah, nothing to talk about. I'm thinking. That's what I thought. Now, we, we talked on Tuesday on a power hour briefly. I'm switching from local work to highway. So what you're seeing in those two samples is three months on my oil. The oldest one is three months, and then the last one was four and a half months. Now, I don't know what the mileage was. I should guess that the mileage on the second sample would be somewhere around 16,000. It, right, it's, so, it's, it's really, really clean. Nothing whatsoever to talk about. Okay. okay, and that's what I thought. I just wanted you to sort of, yep, you know, put my put my unease at rest. Nope that uh, All right. that that engine is running really well. Well, that's what I thought. I, I I cannot tell you how. If we could just find the ghost, there's a ghost in this thing that runs back and forth alongside me every once in a while. He's got a switch in his hand, and he flips that switch, and then all of a sudden the harmonics change. And I lose three to six pounds manifold pressure. Really? And, and then, you know, yep, yep. And then he runs past me and then he'll come back a little while later and he'll find me and he'll flip that switch back on. 
and uh, you know, give me back that six pounds of manifold, and doggone, if it, it, it it's like what? It's six pounds, that's seventy five horse. You feel yeah, that? Yeah, that's a lot. What year and what engine? Two thousand sixty series D deck four, set at five hundred. Huh. Does that have a VGT? And this is the second one. This is. Uh, no. Do I have EGT? Yes. No, VGT. Variable Hardpole. geometry turbo? No, wastegate. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Wonder yeah. if something's and, and, happening and with the wastegate. I, I don't think so because it, it literally is like flipping a switch. It's so instantaneous. Um, you, like, and, and the harmonics change. The engine runs smoother and quieter, vibrates less, and then when he switches it the other way, it's not like when it, when it runs bad. It's not like it's like shaking and rattling and, and right. it's a horrible thing and I hate it or anything like that. It just doesn't run as perfect. Huh. So, I don't know. If I, if I could find that, and I'll tell you, when, when that switch is turned on, I love this motor. I can't wait till till Pittsburgh dials me up to 630 and gets it running the way it's supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Not that I need 630 horse. That's not the point. The point is I want... You want it to run, when, right. You know, like you and... Yeah. I want it to run the way it wants to run. Yeah. You know? Well, all right. I, well, I don't, I'm not the guy that... It, running a 55, you know, I'm not the guy that needs to be at the top of the hill first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, th- this you sample... Know, Certainly looks good. It's tuned right. It sounds like you've got some sort of weird intermittent issue. Um, we got to roll on. The calls are, lines are jammed today. It's um, great stuff. Let's go to Texas. Danny, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. What's um, on your mind today? I didn't send it, an oil sample here. I didn't send it to you, but I just wanted to ask you a couple things the one i did back in february my fuel dilution jumped up to 5.6 Ooh. okay but there was a lot of idle time over the winter uh, up north that's still well, here really on my next oil sample 5.6 is pretty yeah, excessive what did it go to then the one I did here recently, a couple of weeks ago, I just got the results. Uh, it's back down. It's got the, what is that, uh, the little arrow there, minus one. Really? So it's back down to where it's always been. Okay. Well. Because I was thinking maybe an injector, the way this truck would run sometime, act like it'd have a miss. Yeah, it's possible you had an intermittent injector issue. It is also possible that this thing just doesn't like to idle and you were idling it a lot. I mean, it, it just may just be dumping a lot of fuel into the cylinders while it's idling. Uh, but this is one of those cases where if it's not currently broke, I would not mess with it. Yeah. And I was gonna hold. I was gonna have that looked at first. I wanted to wait and see what it was with this sample, and I'm probably. And now I gotta get with uh, Ethan see what his time frame. But I was gonna pull the ECM off, send it up, and let him just go through it, check it out, and see if there's any issues with it, and just have him do a tune and see if. Uh, you know, I get my uh, fuel mileage back up because, yeah. well, up to where it should be because it's never been up, right. you know, anything to brag about. Right. The only other soot is up a little bit. I've got the fleet air. I'm going to have to clean it again. Viscosity is 14.5. And the only other thing is uh, lead kind of jumped up to 58. Oh, they got it flagged, but yeah. yeah. Well, here's I'd keep an eye. I'm on looking that at well, and here's what I'm doing. I'm going to about twenty five thousand on an oil change. So what I'm thinking I need to do, well, I I probably need an OPS. Yeah, but 
need to need to change the filters a little more often, or at least change the oil because if I go if oil uh, do, 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 the lead before that was down around nineteen and twenty on the on the previous two oil changes. Even nineteen and twenty, so, that, that is some lead. If we're under ten, that's just kind of normal everyday wear. But when we start getting up around twenty, we're actually starting to see some bearing wear. How many miles on this engine? No clue whatsoever. Oh, okay. It may be getting near the end of its life. Sometimes we just start to see some bearing wear and some wear metals as it gets towards the end of its life. Nothing I'd be too concerned about. Um, I'd just keep an eye on it. Yeah, copper has been down, uh, been like at two. Yeah. Iron has been, uh, iron was 52, which is rings, correct? Uh, yeah, iron is upper cylinder kind of stuff. You know, when we see iron, it's usually upper cylinder and liners and that kind of thing. I, I don't think, I like I said, I wouldn't get too worried about this. I'd just keep an eye on it. Yep. Well, I'll let you know when I get to does after that. It'll be interesting. Yes, definitely. All right. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Ohio this time. Len, welcome to the program. Oh, you there, Kevin? Yes. What's on your mind today? Hello? Uh, hey, i got two things here. What do you think about the I-bonds paying 9.62%? Um, that's one of the government bonds I was talking about. What's the limit on I-bonds? Is it 10000 a person? Ten. Yes, 10000 a person, which then if, like, being owner operator, we have a business, we could do another 10000 with your EIN number, too. Right. Right. Yeah, that's those are awesome. I mean, you should have those maxed out if you have the cash. You just can't beat a rate like that. Um, and, but the problem is right. it's just limited. I mean, 10,000 now, again, you get you, your spouse, your business, you, you, you know, max out everything you can. You can't beat that rate. I mean, that's incredible. But, you know, you like the. I don't know where this guy's getting a guaranteed 7% on a half a million dollars, though. No, I don't need that. That's what I was trying to kind of yeah. on that. Now, the, the I-bonds are yeah. one of the programs I was talking about. And absolutely, everybody, if you've got the cash, you should have those maxed out. Yeah, that's what my wife and I were talking about, taking it out of our savings account and yeah. buying them, three of them. And that way, you know, it's way better than what your savings account is paying, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would go do and, that. Uh, yeah, and then on another topic, have you heard? Uh, I just reading about the, the nitric oxide. If you use mouthwash, it kills the, the nitric oxide. Did you hear anything about that? It seems like somebody asked me that a while back. I might have forgot to make a note. First off, are they clear on what kind of mouthwash? Does it have to be high in alcohol? Or I mean, there's very different mouthwashes out there. I, I don't know what what component in mouthwash would be causing that. Right. And well, it, it didn't say, it just said about that. Because, you know, I take the cardio miracle and I'm like, well, am I defeating the purpose doing Listerine every day or what? <laughs> um, again, I, I'm, I'm making a note this time because it does seem like... Um, Somebody asked me this once before. Oh, okay. Here's here's something, and I haven't seen this before. So, I, I, first off, let's just in general. I'm not a big fan of really strong mouthwashes, and Listerine is one that's really strong. The idea behind a mouthwash is that it kills bacteria, and it's bacteria that can cause odors. The problem with killing bacteria with mouthwash is it's the same as trying to kill bacteria with an antibiotic. It kills all the bacteria. We want good bacteria in our mouth. There, there actually is a bacteria that lives in our mouth that aids in producing nitric oxide. So that's why this could potentially lower it. Doesn't mean it's going to lower it for everybody. But I, there are other reasons not to use mouthwash every day. 
Okay. It's actually not good for your oral health. You're, you're, one of the best things you can do for your oral health is eat a lot of fermented food to get good bacteria in your mouth. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's what I was curious about. I know you said you got a lot of calls, so. All right. Thanks for the no call. Um, we may be on the last call right now. If you want to jump in, um, all right, and it looks like we do have uh, Rolling Toe coming up next here shortly. Uh, probably within uh, five or ten minutes after I wrap my show up, we'll be heading on into Rolling Toe. Let's go to Missouri. Eric, welcome to the program. I guess I slid in under the wire. You did. Um, <laughs> I, had, uh, I started with one comment, but now i got two things, but they'll be quick. The first one was about when you were talking about um, mortgage mortgages back in the early eighties, you know, I remember that they were like 15, 17% ridiculously high. And you'd said something about, you didn't know what brought them down. And I'm not from experience. Cause I was like a kid going into my teen years back then. But from all the reading I've done, I think those only came down because of the tax law change in around 86 or 87 that made it so that high income employees could no longer negatively gear their investments. So they couldn't just buy whatever property they could grab and then lose money on it and get a tax savings from it. I think that's what that the, you, the you collapse that occurred because of that tax law change you is what correct. brought everything yeah. down. The tax law change in 1986, Reagan's tax law change, was a big one. And it did have a huge impact on real estate back then. You're right. That was probably one of the things that's... And interest rates, like everything else, are cyclical. They happen in cycles. So um, I, I just couldn't remember when it came down. But now that you mention that tax law change... Um, that kind of kicked it off and it kept coming down all the way into the nineties, um, which is when I bought my right. first home in 94, I think. Um, and then that's when they started doing all those, uh, mortgage backed derivative bullshit things that caused the 2008 collapse. Yeah. Right. So. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, yeah. Now the other, that, the other that, thing that I just thought what, of, Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I now I'm remembering that that tax law change did have a big impact on that. I figured that was something you'd known about because you know all the time you spent doing people's taxes and the other kinds of uh, financial planning and whatnot that had to have something to do with it. So, yep. but it was just you know so long ago that it's just I've read a bunch of Robert Kiyosaki books and he goes into things like that in his books. Yeah, so, no, that's exactly right. Um, the other thing was yesterday, I think it was, you were talking about, uh, oh, you were talking about your garden and yes. you'd mentioned something about, uh, not, I keep wanting to say ground cover, but no, uh, like you cover, you, you cover your garden while things are growing in order to like try to prevent weeds and stuff. Something about effect. Yes. And it had just, I had just watched a video. Do you, do you happen to, I don't know if you follow other people, but do you follow the homesteading family on YouTube? Uh, I, I don't. Oh, okay. They're just called homesteading family. I've posted several videos of theirs in the past. In fact, I just posted one the other day about, uh, uh, making tallow out of lard or, or whatever, you know, she, she's boiling down all this pig fat in order to jar it but that wasn't what I was talking about. It's the same family though. They had just put out a video by a guy and I don't have his name, but it, he did a, a documentary called back to Eden. E D E N. He's a very religious guy. If you're not religious, which I'm not, you kind of have to push through it and do the, do the shopping cart method of listening to him. But he talks about how he doesn't do any, weeding or plowing or anything in his, when he grows stuff, he puts down, he starts with like layer of layers and layers of really fine. Like, uh, he sifts out a uh, wood chips and he sifts out the small stuff and uses that. He lay, he layers that on his gardens and it kind of creates a, 
the same kind of ground cover loam that you find in the woods where nobody's been doing anything. And that's what they, they, like I said, they posted a video on that. It starts, it's called, he ran out of water for his garden. The guy has a pump that only produces like half a gallon an hour or something like that. So (laughs) he's not able to just soak everything down. Um, but he made a whole documentary and it's on back to Eden.com. I haven't watched it yet, but, uh, I just thought it was appropriate to what you were talking about yesterday. And it is funny that it just come out. Like, I think I just watched it yesterday before your show. So I was like, Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Kind of yeah, like when the- you're thinking, when you're thinking about pillows and suddenly Facebook gives you a bunch of ads for pillows. I know. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, it, this is one more thing that we've, we've just done it so wrong and it's hard to change your mindset sometimes. You know, we just think of this freshly plowed or tilled field and there's something about that that just seems right. You know, of course you got to, plow this all up and till it and get it ready to plant and it, when it's the exact opposite the least the the, right. the the least amount of disturbance of that soil is what you want like this year i did put in a a, a ground cover over the winter meaning i found a seed mm-hmm. blend that's like seven or eight different seeds and each one does something different for the soil. One, you know, helps it fix nitrogen. One keeps it, you know, the roots keep it busted up and broken up right. And, but each plant was selected because it does something to improve the soil. So instead of leaving bare dirt over the winter, which is the worst thing you can do, you grow this stuff. And it, it especially here, we have a mild winter. It grows all winter. It got probably... Oh, three to four feet tall, and I had seeded it really heavy, so it was thick. I kind of tilled that back in. I, you know, I've had a really small cultivator; yeah. it only goes about three inches down. But even that, they say, you're you're better off if you could not do that. the 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 least amount of disturbance yeah. in the soil is the best way to grow things. Well, what would get to me about that, and that's something I've thought about, too, is because I've heard of, you know, planting covered crops, but then you have to, you have to till those back in or whatever, because anything you plant to grow that is not your intended crop or your vegetable garden or whatever is still pulling nutrients out of the soil. So you have to get them back in. So what you really want to do is be composting over the winter which is well, what this guy I, referred to. He's, you know, yeah, I do. It. He talks about how, what, what does, what does nature do? All the leaves fall in the autumn, you Correct. know, and everything, you know, is on the ground for winter. So just, so that would be an appropriate time for us to do the same thing. You know, whatever you're collecting, wood chips, pine needles, anything, and then just lay it down over your garden and not be growing stuff, but allowing it to, you know, start the process of becoming soil itself. Correct. Yeah, I- I- exactly. And the the ground cover that you grow rather than... Now, you can just cover the soil with, you know, compost or mulch or leaves or grass clippings or whatever. And that's better than leaving bare dirt. But what's even better over long periods of time is not to leave that dirt bare, to have something growing in it. And you mentioned that any plant will take things out of the soil. There are actually plants that put things back in. Beans and peas are a big one. They actually put nitrogen back into the soil. So, you know, that's all part of crop rotation. And they actually refer to this ground cover as green manure. So when you do kind of work it back into the soil and you want to work it in with the least amount of disturbance, but when you do that, that's almost the equivalent of, of manure. You're, you're putting so much back in last year, last winter was the first time I did this and I am blown away by how it changed the soil. It, it, it's incredible what just one season of having a cover crop did. Yeah, and I understand that that's actually how they used to do crop rotations back before they just started, 
you know, tearing up the soil every year all the time. Right. They used to like have their fields out in segments and one would lay fallow for a year or two or three, but they, they, you know, they let it grow into grass or something, you know, like you say, some sort of cover crop. Right. But I think he's doing this in the gardens that he's actually using every year. And so it's still building up. Correct. You know, he talks about the black soil and everything that he ends up with over time. He's been doing it for, I don't know what he said, 40 something years overall, but I can't um, imagine how I just thought I'd say, yeah, his is I've been doing it for two kind of three and I am blown away by how much my soil has improved. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I just thought I'd mention it in case you wanted to look him up at some point. Like I said, it was just a video by the homesteading family. I just, and it said, you know, it started with, he ran out of water or whatever, because they started out with him talking about, you know, his well not producing enough, but he talked about planting things that shouldn't grow where they are. And I don't know where he lives, but he was talking about planting something that needs a lot of water. And I forget what that was. It sounded like a spice because he also mentioned sage, which needs no water. But he says that because like the wood chips for one plant um, hold or they, they spread the water out and hold it in place. But the other one, like sage, there's enough room in the wood chips, even the fine ones that it can you know, it, it gets enough air or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, but it's, no, I, anyway. it's another one of those things where we used to do things correctly and then we stopped doing them correctly. And now some people are just getting back to doing it correctly. Um, we, have to, we have to relearn the right way to do everything, but exactly. he's right. In one thing is if you go out into the, un, if you go out into the woods or whatever, where, you know, nothing has been touched and you just look at how things grow out there. Now, of course, you know, under trees, everything is pretty much dead because trees kill everything else. But, you know, if things grow no, all the time and they're not being watered, they're only, it's always natural. So, well, you're exactly you know, right. Like a, when the we, ground cover is there. Yeah. When we look at gardens and farms, we should be mimicking nature. And that's exactly what a lot of these, um, these processes do. All right. I'm going to wrap this up. We will be back in 10 or 15 minutes with rolling toe. So stay tuned for that. And I will see you back here tomorrow for a freaky Friday. Not sure if John and Joel are joining me yet. We'll check on that, but uh, one way or another, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Stay tuned. Rolling toe is up soon. Be safe be profitable, be fit and healthy, always do the hard work and master the journey.